on the 15th of November 2001, the first episode of Walking with Beasts was released. After the astonishing success of Walking with Dinosaurs, Beasts acts as a sequel series showcasing the events that occurred after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs up to the present day. The main focus of this series is of course the mammals and their remarkable evolution to fill the void left by the dinosaurs. It follows the same six episode formula, with each program set in a certain place and time throughout the Cenozoic era, gradually moving closer and closer to the age of man. In a lot of ways, Walking with Beasts had a much harder job to do when it came to impressing the audience, as dinosaurs were already incredibly famous household names, whereas almost all of the creatures from Beasts were very unknown by the general public. Dinosaurs are also inherently exciting as they appeal to this fantastic, almost mythical, dragon-like animals that can now only exist within our imaginations. Mammals, however, are all around us today, many of which are seen as small, cute and cuddly, quite a stretch from the giant, terrible lizards. Walking with Beasts, however, is able to smash these questionable preconceptions to pieces by showing that mammals are every bit as exciting, interesting and spectacular as the more famous reptiles that came before them. This brings us to the prologue of the first episode, New Dawn. We are shown stock footage of the fight between the Mother Tyrannosaurus and the Ankylosaurus from the final episode of Walking with Dinosaurs, Death of a Dynasty. This footage, however, is interspersed with scenes of small, Mesozoic mammals, with the narration explaining how they have been living in the shadow of the giant dinosaurs, a fate that was first hinted at all the way back towards the end of the first episode of Walking with Dinosaurs, New Blood, with the Cynodons, close relatives of true mammals. The exception of the Didelphodon from Walking with Dinosaurs, these are all brand new scenes and creatures. Whilst going unnamed, these include Gypsonictops, a close relative of a creature we will be introduced to shortly, and whose model it is identical to. Because it's only a brief cameo, I'll refrain from critiquing this creature. Another is Meniscoesus, live acted by a species of squirrel. It's a member of an extinct group of mammals known as multituberculates, which, whilst unrelated, bore a strong resemblance to rodents, so I feel a modern squirrel is a solid choice for a live action counterpart. We then see the extinction scene from Death of a Dynasty with the narration describing it as a stroke of luck for the mammals as it wiped out the oppressive reptiles. This is followed by a brief teaser of what is to come, a montage of all the incredible creatures we will see throughout the series. The narration explains how the Cretaceous extinction wiped out most large creatures, leaving the smaller animals to repopulate the earth, grow and diversify. Among them of course are the mammals, which was also hinted at in Death of a Dynasty. This montage also showcases just how much the effects have improved since walking with dinosaurs, and that is saying a lot. The CGI animation company Framestore really gave it their all, especially considering that mammals and birds were much harder to animate and composite into shots than dinosaurs due to their respective fur, feathers and overall more saggy and wiggly skin and body parts. The CGI is also supplemented by fantastic practical effects with puppets and animatronics by the company Crawly Creatures. We then come to the intro and it contrasts greatly with the very slow and bombastic one of Walking with Dinosaurs. The music is of a much higher tempo and is much more energetic in terms of its instrumentation, going so far as to include tribal chants that are really cool. The visual style, however, remains very similar. The CGI creatures are slightly distorted and composited over a background, this time with blurring filters, however, rather than being monochromatic and partly transparent. The more natural backdrops of dinosaurs are also present here, however they are heavily distorted and layered with a rock-like texture, presumably referencing cave paintings and or paleontology in general. The creatures, the background and the music just make the whole package awesome, and it's the perfect way to get you excited to watch. Okay, and with that we can now start to dissect the actual plot for the first episode, New Dawn. No, not, not that one. Set 49 million years ago in the early Eocene Epoch. Note that I said epoch and not period, as the Eocene is an epoch of the Paleogene period. It is the Middle Paleogene period, to put it another way. When it comes to the Cenozoic, most literature and media tends to use epochs rather than periods, as they grant more specific dates, as the evolution of mammals is incredibly rapid. I hope this clears up any potential confusion. Anyways, the Earth has had roughly 16 million years to heal from the Cretaceous extinction, and in that time, 
the world has become incredibly hot and humid, so much so that tropical forests now grow from pole to pole. This reflects an actual event known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, a time of incredibly high global temperatures speculated to have been caused by volcanism. The episode starts with the narration explaining how in this flowery world, meteors are no longer as much of a threat. This is perpetuated by a puny asteroid striking what will become Germany, startling a small mammal. The narration then explains how in these forests there live a huge variety of mammals, but they are still small. It also accentuates the idea of mammals as a whole still being under the oppressive thumb, if you will, of the dinosaurs, with the role now being filled by carnivorous birds, with the narration going so far as to say, birds rule the earth. So there's quite a bit to unpack here. First of all, mammals were not being utterly suppressed by large predatory birds, as there were already some large mammals by this time, some of which were predators. One even appears later in this very episode, contradicting this narrative. The threat of predation was not limiting mammals into evolving both large body size and occupying top predator niches. Secondly, whilst there were groups of predatory birds, such as forest rockets and bath ornithids. These are only known from the Americas, and as such, are not good examples for perpetuating the idea of birds dominating the planet, especially when this episode takes place in Germany, and the predatory bird in question is Gastornis. Gastornis was a large flightless bird that was also known as Diatrima before being deemed an invalid name. It was a relative of modern waterfowl, such as ducks. Here, it is portrayed as the apex predator of the Eocene forests, hunting the many small mammals it shares its habitat with by crushing them with its powerful beak. Whilst this was a popular theory for many years, more recent studies have found chemical isotopes in the fossils of Gastornis that indicate it had a herbivorous diet. Some researchers, however, such as Dr. Lawrence Whitmer, disagree with this conclusion, arguing that Gastornis's beak would have been overbuilt for feeding on tough vegetation such as nuts and seeds, believing it to be more carnivorous by nature. This is reflected in the CGI model and live-action puppet, as it is practically perfect in terms of accuracy, except for the hooked beak, seemingly added to help sell the idea of this animal being a predator. Despite this, most researchers tend to favour the herbivorous hypothesis. Oh, and the red and blue colour scheme is really striking and awesome. After the title screen, we get a montage of beautiful scenery of the rainforest canopy. This episode was filmed in the Indonesian island of Java, and I think it was a fantastic choice. However, I couldn't help but notice there is a beige filter over almost the entire episode. Perhaps it's there to portray the heat and humidity of this time? I'm not sure. We are then properly introduced to Leptictidium. This was the creature I alluded to earlier, whose model was reused in the prologue. It's a very peculiar and early branching member of the placental mammal family tree. It was a small carnivore with a long nose, tail and hind legs, and is thought to have either run bipedally or hopped like kangaroos. The fur detail and coloration look superb, and incredibly accurate on both the CGI model and live action puppet. This one is aged really well. A female acts as the main focus for this episode, as we view 24 hours in her dramatic life. After narrowly escaping Gastornis the night before, she sets off on her morning hunt to gather food for her and her young. The narration explains how being a warm-blooded mammal gives her the advantage in the cool morning, as the cold-blooded creatures she hunts, such as an unfortunate frog, have yet to warm up, making it an ideal time to hunt. Also, can I just point out how Framestore correctly animated sunlight making the Leptictidium's fleshy ears turn red? That's just fantastic attention to detail right there. Speaking of ears, the narration then explained how she has a strong sense of hearing as well as smell. This is followed by a really cool sequence of the mammal leaping in slow motion to catch a damselfly on the wing. The narration then explains how Europe at this time hosts much volcanic activity due to the northward tectonic movement of Africa. This area is home to many geothermal springs and lakes with poisonous volcanic gases trapped below. These toxic conditions, however, led to exceptionally well-preserved fossils as the unfortunate animals that ended up in these toxic pools remained undisturbed for millions of years. 
We then get a brief glimpse of Euro Tomandua climbing in the canopy, live acted by a northern Tomandua. Seeing as how Euro Tomandua is actually related to pangolins, but more closely resembles anteaters, I think this is a fine choice as a live action counterpart for a brief cameo. We then see a mother Gastornis checking on her egg before seeing off a rival, which in turn scares off the leptic tidium. The narration alludes to this being much like the age of dinosaurs before. As the leptic tidium looks for food by the lake shore, she comes across a newcomer, Ambulocetus. This is one of the earliest cetaceans, aka whales. Ambulocetus is known only from Pakistan. However, the episode states that it has migrated from its original home from the coast, which is very believable in my eyes. Accuracy-wise, it's quite good. However, the legs should not be as sprawled, as Ambulocetus had straight limbs and was probably clumsier on land than is portrayed here. We see a really convincing shot of it entering the water and are treated to some really cool music too. The swimming animation may look a bit funny, but it's honestly very plausible. Whatever the case, it was too much for this Kent Sukas to handle and the lake itself apparently, as the narration alludes to the lake bed having huge quantities of volcanic gases trapped within, and that if much of it was released at one time, it would release huge clouds of poisonous gases for miles around. The Ambulocetus then prepares to ambush a form of small early horse referred to here as Propaleotherium. However, this genus has since been synonymized with Eurohippus, but this was long after the show had aired. Regardless, accuracy-wise, it is practically flawless and both the CGI model and puppet look fantastic. Upon drinking from the lake, the predator erupts from the water, but the horse's lightning-fast reaction saved them. The mother leptic tidium returns to her nest with the narration explaining her hunt was not as successful as desired and that her her next hunt must be better for her offspring's sake. At midday, most creatures take shelter from the heat, and the Gastornis's chick begins to hatch from its egg. The narration then alludes to both being utterly defenseless against one type of predator, ants. Giant, carnivorous ants. That felt so cool to say. This brings us to possibly the most infamous scene in the entire Walking With series. A colony of Titanomerma swarm the hatching Gastornis and strip its flesh to the bone. Isn't nature beautiful? This mortifying scene utilizes both CGI models of Titanomerma as well as live action ants. I honestly don't know how to feel about this scene, but what I do know is that it was certainly memorable. In the wake of horror, we see a brief cameo of a paleopython, live acted by a smooth green snake, before cutting to a small group of Propaleotherium. The narration explains how they are always on high alert, as there are many predators in the forest. As such, they are being stalked by the Gastornis. The bird's hunt, however, is foiled by falling helicopter seeds, startling the mini horses, prompting the Gastornis to charge, but the herbivores have escaped. By late afternoon, the Leptictidium mother is preparing to take her young out on their first hunt, teaching them what is safe to eat, and a gecko makes a cameo. We then cut back to the Ambulocetus, partaking in some interesting speculative behaviour, placing his jaw on the ground to detect vibrations of potential prey items. The narration states this is the same apparatus that allows him to hear underwater. I have no idea if this is plausible, but who knows. Nearby to the Leptictidium family are some Propaleotherium. They have been feeding on fermented grapes, which contain a small amount of alcohol, but it has created some very drunk mini-horses. As such, the careless herbivores are ambushed by the Gastornis in a really cool slow-motion panorama sequence, with helicopter seeds falling all around. The carnivore clamps its beak down on the horse before lifting it and shaking the life out of it. Whilst not necessarily true, the line this is a world where birds eat horses is still really cool and chilling. Leptictidium also flee, narrowly dodging an attack from the Ambulocetus. Upon returning to her nest, however, the Gastornis discovers the remains of her chick. After sunset, we then get a really cool shot and our proper introduction to Godinosha, an early nocturnal primate. 
Whilst I like the colour scheme, the model is very monkey-like, whereas Godinosha is thought to have more closely resembled a lemur, due to it being more closely related. We then see the Ambulocetus has still not made a kill by nightfall. This brings us to a very strange creature, the Lesmesodon. This was a type of hyenodont, but it is only identified as a small predator, and just uses the model of a creature we will see in episode 3. From what I can tell, this creature should have shorter, stockier legs and a longer snout. The Ambulocetus attacks and eventually drowns this enigmatic predator. At midnight, the Ambulocetus comes ashore to rest, whilst a pair of Godinosha get it on. However, their lovemaking is interrupted by another Godinosha shaking a bush. Okay. In actuality, the animal is spooked by an oncoming earthquake, which in turn releases the toxic gases from the lake bed, sending a poisonous cloud as foreshadowed earlier, suffocating countless animals. One such unfortunate creature is the Ambulocetus, whose body is discovered by the family of Leptictidium. The narration then explains the irony of Leptictidium's kind becoming extinct as the world's climate begins to cool and their forest habitat begins to disappear, whereas Ambulocetus's kind, the whales, will conquer the oceans, which also foreshadows the focus of episode 2, but not before a neat little hint of his body's fate with a single carnivorous ant crawling across his head. To conclude, I really enjoyed this episode. However, two major issues hold it back from being one of my personal favourites. One, the tone feels a bit overly grisly for my liking, with the constant threat of the toxic lake and pretty intense kill scenes being the main factors. The second is the reused footage, as there was an awful lot in this episode. For example, this one shot of the Gastonis was used five times. Still, the plot was solid, the visuals were beautiful, mostly. And it's one of my personal favourite time periods. Thank you so much for watching, and be sure to check out my review on Walking With Beast's second episode, Whale Killer, sometime in the future. Bye bye now.